morning and happy Sabbath to, to everyone here. I may, not, I may need to speak a little low, lower. Uh, so I want to welcome our members, but especially our visitors. I want to give a warm welcome to each one that's here visiting us this morning. May we all feel the love of God as we seek his face this morning. So before I start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kneel down and pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll start this, this first angel's message. Uh, as I'm up here, as I pray, y'all pray for me. May the words that we speak are not my words, but uh, Jesus' words, because he has something to say to us this morning as we gather together. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that we're here this morning. We ask a special blessing for each, each person in this sanctuary that you allow the Holy Spirit to start moving in this place and that our hearts are receptive to hear what you have for us this morning. Father, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness and help us be the people that you want us to be before you come and take us home. Bless each person here in a mighty way, and may, may the words that, you, that I speak be not my words, but speak through me, Father, and allow me to get out of the way, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if, we, if we've been part of the church for a little while, we, we probably understand that in Revelations 14, that message, that the three angels' message is to be given out for all the world before he comes. And it's a solemn warning. It's probably the most solemn warning that's given to mankind this morning in, in God's word. And then if we look at it closely, which we're going to try to do this morning, uh, it has to do with worship. And we talked about it a little bit in class this, this, this morning as how the world is going to be and how it's going to be polarized into two different groups. And are we going to follow God's law or are we going to follow man's law? And that's going to be the great test that we're going to have in the future. And I think this test is coming up on us sooner than later. It's not going to be long with the way the world is in the world that we live in today. But when Jesus comes for his bride, which is going to be the purified church, when he comes... That's going to be, the world's going to be divided into two groups. And those that have the seal of God and that those that are going to receive the mark of the beast. And many people may not understand what the mark is, <clears throat> which is found in Revelation 13. I pray that we are studying and we understand because those that receive the mark are going to be lost. And they're also going to receive something else. I'll, I didn't have this, but we can go to Revelation 16 as I start. For those that receive the mark and not the seal, this is going to be this is going to be what they're going to experience. Revelation 16, and I'm going to read verse two, and this is and it's talking about the seven last plagues. <clears throat> And I'll start with verse one. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a, a, a noisome and grie grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. So that's what's going to come upon those that receive or, or, or in the group or the camp of those that have the mark of the beast. And that's something that we don't want as, as God's people. We don't want to be in that camp. We want to be in the other camp where we, we, we receive the seal of the living God. So the prophet of the Lord wrote in early writings, it says, the little remnant, page 66, the little remnant who love God and keep his commandments, and are faithful to the end will enjoy this glory and ever be in the presence of Jesus and sing with the holy angels. So it's important that this little remnant, that they love God and they keep the commandments and are faithful to the end. 
And as, as us being faithful to the end, we're going to be able to, to see, be in the presence of Jesus and sing with the holy angels. I hope that is our desire this morning because I truly believe Jesus is coming soon. And it's not just words. I'm not just up here speaking things that I don't believe. I truly believe as we see the way the world is, I truly believe Jesus is coming. Amen. And we have to really believe that. And if we really accept that fact that he is coming, what is that doing to me spiritually? How am I living my life? Am I more faithful to him on a daily basis? Am I reading his word more? Am I telling others that this world is about to perish and that you have to seek the Lord while you have time? Because there's going to come a time that we're, that we're not going to be able to seek him. And, and, and that time is called the close of probation. When that happens, it's too late for all of us. When, when, when Noah and his sons and their wives got into the ark, and the doors closed, the angels closed the door. At that time, their clothes of probation, everybody that was outside the ark, they didn't know it, but they were going to be lost. And they were lost. They perished. And Noah preached that the flood was coming for 120 years. But the results of that was just his family that got into the ark. The, ark, the door is open right now, and Jesus is calling us to come and rest and have a relationship with him. If we don't, it's going to be sad for those that of us that make it to heaven, and we're going to say, where's my brother and where's my sister at our local church? Besides every, you know, our family members, where are they at? And was it because maybe my character wasn't Christ-like that I might have said something or I might have gotten upset with someone that they didn't see Jesus in me? So the way we live our life, the, the, the way the things that are affecting us on a daily basis, we have to give our life to Christ and allow him to lead us. And may he walk with us. I'm spending, as I spend time at work, I'm more, so I'm, I'm more in, in thought of him when I get in the truck. I'm, I'm thinking more of him. I'm thinking, am I reflecting you the, the way you want us to reflect you to those that, that I'm around? Because some of them don't go to church, but Jesus wants them in heaven. And I don't want to do anything to give a wrong impression of what Jesus is. Because Jesus loves us. He, he sent his son to die for us. He wants all of us in heaven. And our desire should be that we should want all of everyone that we come in contact with to be in heaven. And sometimes we look at their deeds and we're like, well, this person, maybe not that person. Or maybe not this person. No, Jesus died for that person. Jesus wants them in heaven. Jesus can turn the, the, the vilest, cruelest person, he could come into their life and change their heart. And they can become Christ-like. They, be, they can have a passion for Jesus and go and tell everybody, this is what Jesus did for me. I've experienced Jesus in my life. And now I'm telling you that if he changed me, he could change anybody. So, and that should be our, our witness you know, we, we want to have a, a witness. We want to be able to know what Jesus has done for us. So if y'all have your Bibles, I hope y'all do. Turn with me to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, we'll start there for right now. Jeremiah 29, and I'm going to read verse 13. And it says, and ye shall seek me and find me when you, when you shall search for me with all your heart. All your heart. What does it mean to search for him with all your heart? There's so many things in this world that can distract us from searching for Jesus with all our heart. And we have to give those things up. 
And some things may be harder than others to give up. But we have to submit to the Lord. We have to pray and seek him because he is coming. And our desire should have to where we want each of us. I want all my church family in heaven. I want all my family, my earthly family in heaven. And then I want all those that maybe I don't even know or don't go to church, maybe my coworkers, I want them in heaven too. And Jesus wants them in heaven too. So I pray that we do seek him. You know, there's a, a device that we all use every day, and that device can limit us from seeking him. That device can, can put us, and then before you know it, whatever you're on, whatever app or whatever social media platform we're on, time has passed. And I've spent, out man, three hours have passed, four hours have passed. But then in the evening, we, we may turn off the TV or, or we may say, now it's time to read God's word or pray. And I end up start, starting reading maybe the Gospels. And within a few minutes, I'm sleepy. I, I, don't even under, I don't even know where I stopped, what verse did I stop reading? Why? But I can turn on a movie and I can stay watching it for three hours without blinking, without going to the bathroom. I'm wide awake. But when I open his word, I'm sleeping. I'm tired. Lord, forgive me. I want to go to sleep. And we go to bed. Seek him with all of our hearts. Means this should be our first work in the morning. And it should continue throughout the day. I pray that's what, that's what, we're, that's what we're doing. Because we are told in prophecy not only in the Bible, but the books of Sister White, the prophetic books that she wrote, that trouble will not decrease as we get closer to his return. That trouble is going to increase. With each year, trouble is going to become more and more as we get closer to his return. So I ask, as we see this trouble, I ask, what are we as Christians what are we letting the world know? Are we letting them know how, how, much, how short this time is before he comes? Are we telling others of Jesus' soon return? Because our desire should be more Christ-like. And if we read the Gospels and we read the life that Jesus did, he did stand up in the synagogue as his custom was, on the Sabbath and read from the scriptures. But he also walked a, 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 in, a line, in, in a way that he helped everyone that he came across. And the question is, are we doing that too? Do we care enough for people that we're helping them as much as we can? Do we care enough for friends at school to tell them, I go to church and I go to church on the Sabbath or our coworkers or our family members, how important it is to be obedient to God's word, to his commandments. Because the Bible says in John 14, 15, if you love me, only if you love me, but if you love me, there's something that you need to do if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's what we are to follow. In 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, in that not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants all of us in heaven. He's paid the price for us to go. He's given us the gift of salvation. The question is, are we seeking him are we understanding this gift that he gave us and it wasn't a cheap gift you know guys think about at work they think about you know they have expensive vehicles they have trucks that are expensive and they always tell me you know hey frank i know you have a bunch of old cars and uh why don't you go buy your wife a new car or buy yourself a new truck and i'm like well i don't know how much do they cost 
And they tell me this outrageous number. And I'm like, no, we're not going to do that. I said, that truck or that car or this house, none of that is going to go with me to heaven. Why would I spend that amount of money on, on something that's earthly here? No, that's, that's, that's not our, our, our thoughts. Our thoughts should not be on, on these worldly things now. We're too close to Jesus' coming to be worried about these things of, of the world. Because none of that's going to go with us. Only our character of how we are. And have we allowed the Holy Spirit to change us? Are we helping others? And if we're not, why not? Are we just absorbed in selfishness so much that this is, this is, this is how I spend my week? Because we all come here and, and we gather together on, on this holy Sabbath day. And, you know, I come in my suit. Hopefully I'm pleasing to the Lord in the dress that I come in. But how am I away from here? Do I care for my brothers and sisters? Do I share this love that he says he has, God is love in the Bible? Do we share that with others? By our actions, do people know that I am a follower of Christ. I pray that they do. And are we pleading with Jesus to change our character on the inside? That sin, that, that whatever sin that we're dealing with, are we saying, please, Lord, take this away because I want to be in the kingdom when you come. I hope we're, we're spending more time on our knees. I don't know if y'all realize, but every time God's word is open, it's not open for entertainment. This, this is not a Hollywood movie. When it's open, Jesus is seeking to break the spell of sin in our lives. He's telling us, turn away from sin. So this is the appeal that he's making. And some of us think, well, this church that once I'm a follower of Christ, that I'm under grace, which is true, according to Ephesians 2, that we are under grace and it's not of our works. But our works should define my relationship with him. I should be able to, because of the, because of I, the love I have for him, I'm going to be faithful or obedient to his word. And that's what he's looking for, obedience to his word. So before he comes, sin has to be surrendered. We have to give it up. And whatever we have to do to do that, we have to give it up. We have to plead with the Lord, take our sin away. He's, when he comes, he's looking for a, a purified and blessed church a church without spot or blemish. So that church that's purified, that's without spot or blemish, that's a church that's holy, that is without sin. And many people say, you know, we can't, we're always going to sin here on earth. The Bible says Enoch walked with the Lord, right? And he, his walk was, 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 was so great with the Lord that he was translated to heaven. And he was around a wicked world. We're around a wicked world. How are we submitting ourselves to him and ask, begging him, asking him, please take away this, these thoughts I have in my head or this sin that I'm dealing with, whatever sin it might be. Because I want to be part of that purified church. I want to be ready when he comes and takes us home. He says, come to me. Jesus is saying, come to me. For those that, that haven't came to him, those that haven't baptized, come to me and I will give you rest. Sister White writes in Gospel Workers, page 148, verses, uh, or paragraph one and two. It says, ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of our faith of Seventh-day Adventists. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelations should be carefully studied in connection with the words, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. So those books are a revelation 
of Jesus Christ. And then in paragraph two, she writes, the 24th chapter of Matthew is presented to me again and again as something that needs to be brought to the attention of all. And why would she write that? We are living in a time when the predictions of this chapter are fulfilling. So we are seeing what's, what was, what's in Matthew 24, we are seeing now. And God says, open your eyes and be awake to see what's happening in the world. Because a lot of things are happening. You know, I don't know if y'all paid attention that this past week we had three banks, three or four, that have failed. So imagine if you had your money in those banks. You're like, whoa, this bank is closed. And I have money in there. And then we start thinking, can I, is the government still going to be able to give me that money that I have in there? Because it's my money. I put it in there, right? And now the bank is closed. Is that prophetic? Is that a sign that we should see before Jesus comes? Yes. Where do we find that at? Turn with me to Luke 21. And I'm going to read uh, Luke 21. I'm going to read from verse 25 and 26. And it says in Luke 21. And so this Luke 21 is, 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 is almost the same chapter as Matthew 24. The same signs are there. But each, each, each gospel has a little bit, they add a little bit more to, to, to our understanding uh, of the signs that we're going to see before Jesus comes. So in Luke 21, verse 25, it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts are failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So go back with me to 25. And it says, And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. That word per perplexity means economy or financial stress that we're dealing with. In the end, when Jesus comes, there's going to be trouble in the economy. And we see that now with these banks closing, right? And now we're thinking, you know, you know, I don't know who y'all bank with. I bank with Wells Fargo. So in my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder if Wells Fargo is going to be one of the banks that close in the future. And the little bit that we have there, what are we going to, you know, are we going to be able to, to use it? So that's, a, a, that's a, a, a fulfillment of prophecy of what's going to happen. And what needs to happen? If, that, if these banks fail, what, what, what has to happen? For, for us to get, to, to get a new economy, a new way of living, the way we live. Right now we're in a cash society, right? So I can go to the bank right now and I can withdraw cash, either in the teller or inside the bank. We have the ability to draw, and we can pay with, with cash, right? Everywhere we go, we can pay with cash. But there's a system coming that's, that, in other words, this system of cash has to crumble so that another system can come. What's the other system, do we know, that's going to come? Electronic or digital, right? Central bank digital, right? And what does that do when it's digital? How is that going to affect us as, as, as if it, when this digital system comes? Is it going to track us? Yes. yes. Are we going to have, are they going to have access to deny us the use of our own money? Yes. Yes. Is that biblical? Yes. Where do we find that at? Revelations chapter what? 13. So turn with me to Revelations 13. And I'm going to show a little video of Melanie. We can show the the Tucker with that that young that lady or that lady with the short video, and then that lady with Tucker. We'll show that in a minute. But let me read this. 
starting with verse 15. It says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And then verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So in the future, if we stay faithful to the Lord, we're not going to be able to buy or sell. And we're like, how is that possible? You know, I can always go and draw cash out of the bank. So I'm going to show two little clips, two little videos, and uh, it's, it's going to show us what's coming or what the plan is for them to, to come into the what's going to happen in the future as far as the way we, 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 we have cash and the way we, we, we buy and sell things. Go ahead, Melanie. Okay, so what that means is if you have money in your bank account and the new rule is you're not allowed to transact further than five kilometers from your home, your, your card won't work more than five kilometers from your home. If they don't want you buying pizza, you can't buy pizza with money in your, in your bank account or with your card. It is complete control and it solves the taxation without representation problem because if they want more taxes, they just come take it out of your account. So when the World Economic Forum said it's 2030, you have no assets and you're happy, what I hear is it's 2030, we took all of your assets and you're mind controlled, okay? So that was one, that was this young lady speaking and she just mentioned how we're gonna be under this control, how the system is gonna to change to go digital and in that changing of, of, of cash less society, they're gonna be able to control what we buy and what we sell. So God is telling us to get off this worldly system and, and, and be able to provide for ourselves. And whatever that means for each one of us, if that means go to the country and have a little bit of land and grow our own food, then that's, that's what we have to do. Uh, because these issues are real. They're happening before our eyes. Men are, are afraid, are, are fearful, because now all of a sudden my bank closed. Now, I didn't have a problem a week ago when my bank was, was open, but now that it's closed, now I have, now I'm scared. You know, is my, do I still have money? Can I still pay my bills? If I'm a businessman, can I still pay my employees? All of those are issues that, that, we're, that we're seeing, and those are signs that Jesus is coming. And then also from this pulpit, our ministers are to give a certain sound along with the gospel. We are to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. And I don't know how many of us know who that is, or if we studied this man of sin, or the Antichrist, or who he is, but that is what we are to expose, because all of these systems of, uh, in all these different countries are following this man of sin. According to Revelations, it's the same chapter in chapter 13 that the whole world is going to wonder after this beast power. And we can see that happening now. So the question is, are we proclaiming that up here in the pulpit? Or are we saying, you know, life is... Life is okay. I got money in the bank. Life is okay. You know, I have a job. I'm not going to worry about all these things that are happening in the world. God wants a people, and he has a mission for us. We are to prepare a people to stand before the coming of the Lord. So I hope that that's what we're doing. Inspiration says that the only thing as far as the church being purified the only thing that will cause a shaking and it separate the wheat from the tares is the straight testimony given by ministers up here. So that's what we need to give. 
It's the only way or the only thing that will purify the church and we can truly become the bride of Christ. In prophecy, it's meant to agitate us or wake us up and to show us that we cannot hold on to sin because probation is about to close. In the Great Controversy, page 425, it reads this. Sister White wrote, Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in this battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, there's to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people on earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelations 14, the three angels. This is what we are to do, a work of purification, of putting away of sin. Can I do that on my own? No. Who has to help me? Jesus and the Holy Spirit, right? And the more we seek him, as in Jeremiah said, seek him with all your heart that he may be found. The more we seek him, the more he's going to allow me to, to, to purify myself and put away sin. Amen. And that we'll be ready. So the issue at the end will be with worship and do we obey man's law or do we follow God's law? Now turn with me to Revelation 14, 6 to our scripture reading. And I'm going to read just verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's verse 6. So this message of this angel who does he go out to? To all the world, right? For the entire world to hear. It's the last message of warning and mercy to light, lighten up the whole earth with his glory. The everlasting gospel is the everlasting good news concerning Christ as our Savior. It is Christ-centered, and the message is Christ as our sin bearer or our high priest. Now turn with me to Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew 24. And I'm going to read verse 14. So re try to remember what, what, what Revelation 14, 6 says. It says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach into all the world. Now, Revelation... Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel, this is Jesus speaking of the signs that's going to happen before he comes. And this gospel, is that the same gospel of Revelation 14, 6, the everlasting gospel? Yes, yes it is. Okay. So, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. So we read that. In that verse, what word do sometimes we miss that we don't really pay attention to? What, what word is there that we might not pay attention to? Witness. What, so it says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness. What is a witness? If I say... I witnessed the car accident. What does that mean? I saw. So I didn't only hear the car crash. I saw the car crash, right? So this gospel that we are to proclaim to all the world as a witness. So it's not only preaching this gospel to a lost world. It's also this world seeing it in us seeing the transformation that has happened in us because of this gospel and that they can see now, they're, they're, they're a witness to see how this group of people, how this small group of followers, how they live their life. So we are a witness to the world. So the question is, 
are our witness, the witness that we give out, is it, is it in, in, in conjunction with this gospel? Are, are we allowing the world to see what it means to walk with Christ? Or maybe we just come to church as, a, as tradition. Maybe our parents grew us up in the church and we just come to church and, you know, I can't wait till church is over. And then leave. And then don't think about Jesus the rest of the week. That type of Christian, will he be saved? No. So we are to be a witness, this everlasting gospel to all the world. The world has to see the gospel in us. And that it has the power that it proclaims that it has. So in that power that it has, it's going to, the world is going to see the life and the character that we have. Amen. So let's turn, let me turn to 1 Thessalonians, or I'll just read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. The apostle Paul wrote, for our gospel came not into, into you in word only. So it didn't just come in word in preaching, but also in power and that the and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. So we're able to see it in his life, the way he lived, his, the character that Paul was. So this gospel was a witness to those in Thessalonica that he has, his life has been transformed by Jesus. Now, let's go back to Revelations, and I'm going to read verse 7 of this first angel's message. Verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made the heavens, the earth and the sea and all the fountains of the earth or the fountains of water. I'm sorry. So there's a lot of truth in that. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. So how many of us are parents? Quite a few of us are parents, right? How do children honor their parents? By obedience, right? So when God wants us to honor him, he wants us to be obedient to him. Just like we want our children to, to obey us as parents. And what happens when our children don't honor us or, or aren't obedient to what the rules of the house are. Do we kick them out? Psh. Do we kick them out and say, You're, you can't live here no more? Or do we talk to them and say, you know, I was your age at one time. I did things right that were not godly, that were not right in the sight of God. But God has forgiven me. And then we sit there and we pray together and that, he understands that, that we have a God that, that loves us and that forgives us. That's how we are to be with, with our family. So there's a lot of different truths in this, just this one verse. The first truth I want to talk about is the announcement. The hour of his judgment has come points to the closing work of Christ for the salvation of men. This work of judgment began in 1844 and must continue until all the cases are decided, both the living and the dead. So it will extend all the way to the close of probation. It also tells us in this verse to fear God. Does God want us to be afraid of him? But it says fear God. Honor God. So in other words, not fear like I'm afraid, but honor. And in that fearing of God, there's something that we are to do. And that tells us that we fear him. Worship, Worship okay. So turn with me to Deuteronomy. And I'm going to read from chapter 5. And this tells us about fear. What does it mean to fear the Lord? And I'm almost done. So what does it mean that we fear God? So Deuteronomy 5, verse 29 says, Oh, 
that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and do what? And keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and their children forever. So when God says fear, what does he want us to do? To be obedient and keep his commandments. So is that the only verse that says that, that specific phrase? Turn with me right there, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 2. That thou might, mightest fear the Lord thy God, and to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I have commanded thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that the days may be prolonged. Second verse that says that what does it mean to fear? To keep his commandments. So that's two. Now Deuteronomy 8, 6. What does that say? Or is there a pattern that we're seeing? Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of God, of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. So when we fear the Lord, we keep his commandments. Always after fear, God says, keep his commandments. Is there one more that we can find that talk about that? There is. And I'm trying to find it. I believe it's in... Deuteronomy 6. I'm going to say it's in Ecclesiastics. So let's go to verse chapter 12 of Ecclesiastics. And I'm going to read verse 13 and 14. And it says in, 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 in chapter 12 of verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the whole matter. This has everything to do with anything in our life. This is the whole matter of, of, of our existence here on earth. And what are we to do? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So that's the whole thing, that we are to fear God and keep his commandments. Now turn with me to Psalms 111, and I'm just about done now. Psalms 111, and what does that say? And I'm going to read from verse 7 and verse 8 of Psalms 111. And it says, The works of his hand are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprighteousness. How long do these commandments last? You mean they're not done away with? But we're under, we're, we're under grace, right? According to Ephesians. So what does that mean as far as us keeping the commandments? If we love the Lord and it just says fear, right? And every time it said fear, it said keep the commandments. So, so this law is the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses. And there's different, many different verses about the law. In Romans uh, 7, 7, it says, I have not known sin, but by the law. The law points, up, points out our sin and our need of a Savior. And then we should also note that the, that the law cannot save us, that we're saved under grace, according to Ephesians. Saved, we are saved by grace through faith and out of our works, lest any man should boast. So we're making it clear that Jesus saves us, but because he does, and because we walk with him, that we are going to follow the law. And in that law, there's one commandment that the world has forgotten, and it starts with the word remember. We are to remember this day. This is going to be an issue as we get closer and closer to his return of do I stay faithful to the Lord 
and he's requiring me to come to, to have this Sabbath day holy and worship him on this day that he created and that he made holy. I was talking to a gentleman this morning, and I, I keep seeing him, and he tells me, uh, I told him, come to church, but he says he has to go to work. I said, well, you know, by knowing who me, I said, you know that, that we go to church on the Sabbath, that this is part of his Ten Commandments. He said, the Lord knows I love him. He said, I worship him every day. I follow him every day. I said, that is so true because I do the same thing. But that doesn't take the, uh, away the fact that God made a certain day holy and that we are to honor that day. So he says, he says, how do you know it's the Sabbath? He said, many churches go to church on Sunday. I said, that's true. I said, if you spend time with me and we can go have a thorough Bible study, we can go through God's word and we can see. Because that will be an issue at the end. And those that he has in the Sunday keeping churches that love him with all their heart, they're going to hear his voice and they're going to come out of those and come to this truth. And then the bride of Christ will be purified. He'll have a holy bride. And then he's going to come for that bride to take us home. Amen. So I pray that we're all part of that. Amen. And lastly, this first angel's message, it brings us to worship our creator. We have a creator. That's why we come to church on the Sabbath, because we do have a creator. Our creator made us. He made everything that, that we can see. He made this whole world, this universe. And the Bible speaks of God as a creator. And those verses that talk about the heavens, the earth, and the sea, that's part of our Sabbath commandment also. So when we come to church on the Sabbath, we are worshiping our creator. We are letting the world know, I'm going to be obedient to my creator. And I'm going to be obedient to his word. And that's in direct contrast to, to the rest of the world. The rest of the world says, no, there's another day that I made and I made holy. You come and worship on that day. But nowhere in God's word is there a verse that says that this day got changed. But there was prophesied in Daniel that there was a system that was going to come and change it. And that has happened. But we are to be faithful to God in everything that we do. So I hope that as we go through our, our weekly away from here, whatever we have to deal with during the week, that we tell others of this, one, Jesus is coming. One, he wants us to be faithful and obedient to his word. And one, that he loves us with all his heart. And he sent his son to die for us on a cross. And very soon, that same Jesus is coming to take us home. So I pray all of us here. And not only here, we have influence with our family members that aren't here. And they may be all over. The, they may be in Africa. They may be in Mexico. Who knows where our, where our extended family is or the people that we work with to let them know, too, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. So God bless y'all. I hope y'all heard Jesus speak this morning and that very soon he's going to come and take us home. Amen.